Please welcome to the stage Dave De DeLong, Senior iOS Engineer at Snap. Hi everyone. I feel like there's a joke in here of how many engineers does it take to make a keynote work. Um, yeah, so my name is Dave DeLong. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm a Senior iOS Engineer at Snap. Um, I'm also a guy who has way too much time to think about things, so that's where this talk comes from. Um, before we get into this talk, I have a couple of like heads up items I want to give you. Uh, first, uh, I have the need to say that the thoughts expressed here are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of my employer or others who work there. Shout out to the legal teams, hello. Um, also, since we're going to be talking about MVC, uh, there's going to be the potential for a bunch of confusion when we're talking about views and controllers and stuff. So I want to make it clear that when I talk about a view, I am not necessarily meaning a UI view. When I talk about a controller, I am not necessarily referring to a UI view controller. I will do my absolute best to say UI view controller or UI view when that's what I'm actually referring to. Um, I've also put a lot of work into making sure that in the slides when I'm talking about the UI kit concept, it's in the mono space font like code uh, versus the MVC concept, which will just be normal text. Um, I also want to point out that hopefully as we go through this, a lot of the concepts that we talk about will be oddly familiar. Um, I hope that what you get away from this is that um, it's just familiar concepts, but perhaps applied in unexpected ways. Um, you will see lots of things that are extremely familiar about MVC. Um, you might also notice things that are familiar from other patterns, such as MVVM uh, or even React or even functional reactive programming. So with that out of the way, uh, let's talk about MVC. MVC, as we're all aware, is the standard Cocoa architectural pattern. It's the one that Apple decided to use in order to build all of their uh, frameworks. They've been using it for decades, uh, all the way back into AppKit, which comes from the next era. Um, and when we talk about MVC, this diagram should look oddly familiar. We've got this concept of a controller, um, and it you know, talks to a model. The model relays information back controller turns around and hands that off to the view, uh, which is generally like a, a UI concept. Um, and then the view can propagate back uh, some action information. So this is what we, what we mean generally when we talk about model view controller. Now, there are some things that, uh, like we saw yesterday, that sometimes the lines between these get blurred. Um, I hope you take away from this as unblurring some of those lines. And so because of that, I kind of have an objection to calling this a pattern. And I would say that MVC is actually more like a philosophy. Um, there are a lot of patterns out there that if you look at them closely enough or from certain perspectives, uh, such as MVVM, they're actually kind of like MVC from a different point of view. The philosophy is that we want to separate the concerns. We want to separate the parts of our app. We want to separate the, the data that we're actually saving and the data that we're actually working on. We want to have that be a separate concept from the algorithms that we write, the business logic, the things that make our app unique. And we want to separate all of that from how it's visually represented to the user. Uh, unfortunately, we get into the situation where MVC is easily abused. Um, we've heard a lot of references to this abuse. Uh, quick shout out, what is the abuse? Massive view controller. Um, I'm not sure if this was the first time uh, that joke was made, but it's certainly back there. This is a tweet from 2013. And yeah, we deal with these massive view controllers. We these view controllers that you know we subclass a UI view controller or even an NS view controller, um, and we start dealing with view loading and actions and model observation and networking 
and then data sources, and some delegates, and some trait collections, and then of course all of our business logic, which is actually what makes our app unique. And when we deal with massive view controller, we kind of get into this, this situation of like, I've got a view controller and I kind of have no idea what it actually does. It's hard to understand. I can't isolate it. I can't make changes to this and be reassured that I'm actually making the changes in such a way that they're only affecting this one spot. Uh, so I can't change them. I can't test them. And we've heard a lot about testing so far. Um, and yeah, testing of UI view controller can be a little complex, but I don't think it should have to be. Hopefully by the end, we'll have found some ways that will make uh, testing a view controller easier, a UI view controller. And we get into the situation of a massive view controller and we come across these things that are 2,000 lines long. And this is common. And what's really sad about MVC, uh, massive view controller is that even 10,000 line view controllers aren't rare. They're, you come across them pretty frequently. And when you come across them, you don't want to live on this planet anymore. Like, no one wants to work with a 10,000 line view controller. No one even wants to work with a 1,000 line view controller. So, what if I told you you could fix MVC? So how are we going to do this? Let's make a better MVC. Now, normally, we have this urge to rewrite things we don't like. We come across some code and we're just not quite sure we get how it's working, so we have this urge to rewrite it. And when it comes to architectural patterns, it's something like this. Might not necessarily be FRP, maybe it's Viper, maybe it's Discover, maybe it's you know whatever the new hotness is this month. Do not write, refactor, okay? As we've heard, rewriting is almost always the wrong choice. So we're going to refactor MVC, and by so doing, we're going to hopefully end up at a point where we have a better pattern. We're going to do this by making a series of observations. Uh, there are going to be eight observations, and hopefully by making these observations and then applying them to the MVC pattern or the MVC philosophy, we will have come up with something better. So, first observation. Patterns are like data structures. Let's talk about data structures. When we talk about data structures, we're talking about ways of organizing data. And the way in which we organize data affects how fast it is to do certain things. Uh, for example, we know that if we want to find if an array contains an item, that that is an O of N operation. In the worst case, we have to look at every single item in the array to find it. But if we use a different data structure, like a set, then containment is a constant time operation. It's O of 1. There are performance characteristics for, uh, that affect how we store data and that guide our choices. There are also memory characteristics. We could, in theory, write a data structure that is constant time lookup, uh, constant uh, time insertion, maybe, uh, ordered, and all this stuff. But in order to do this, we would have to essentially store every variation of that data under the hood, and it would take up a lot of memory, lots of indexes and, and things like that. So it'd, it'd be difficult, but we can do it. And so we choose different data structures for how much space they take up in memory. But if we choose the right structure, then it makes certain problems really easy, and hopefully it's the problems we're trying to solve. Well, this also applies not only to data, but to code. There are performance characteristics in how we write code, and there are a bunch of different kinds of performance characteristics. Uh, depending on the level of abstraction that we choose when we're writing our code, there might be performance characteristic, characteristics for having to translate our intention between those various layers of abstractions. There's also the performance characteristic from the point of the view of the coder. 
If I choose a code structure that is completely weird and unfamiliar, I'm going to be a slower or a less performant coder. There are also memory characteristics. Again, if I choose a, a, a pattern that, you know, takes up lots of space and is doing lots of caching and maybe in-memory diffing and so on, then this is a, a pattern that will use a lot of memory versus others that might not use as much. There's also the memory characteristics for me as a coder. Again, if I choose an unfamiliar pattern or if I choose a very esoteric pattern, this takes up memory. There's more that I have to remember as a programmer. But again, if we choose the right structure, the right pattern, then hopefully that makes the right problems easy to solve. So let's talk about how we choose those structures. Um, when it comes to data structures, it's really hard to go wrong with array, set, and dictionary. There are some situations where we want uh, a multi-set or a bag. There are some situations where we want an ordered dictionary or an ordered set or a counted set or, or so on. But generally, we find that these are the ones that we always go to. And very rarely do we find ourselves saying, boy, I really wish I had an AVL tree right now. Again, when it comes to choosing a code structure, I would say that it's really hard to go wrong with MVC. And I'm not necessarily meaning Apple's MVC. I'm talking about the philosophy of I'm separating data from logic from display. But there are other patterns that are also valid. They're all tools, and I'm not going to get into like when these tools are appropriate, but I want you to understand that they are appropriate in situations and that it's one of our responsibilities as programmers to learn when those tools apply. So learn respective strengths and weaknesses. So this is the first operation. Uh, patterns are like data structures. Observation number two. Naming affects perception. Um, I think we're all aware that naming is one of the two hardest problems in computer science. How you name things is, is really difficult. We spend a whole lot of time bike shedding uh, what the name of a thing should be. And what we end up choosing as the name affects how we view it. So if I say I've got an NS something, we automatically assume that it's probably not going to be a UI level concept. There might be a couple of ifs about this. Well, what if it's like an NS attributed string that's kind of UI-ish? Um, or maybe uh, it's an NS layout constraint that's also kind of UI-ish. Of course, this is applying to iOS and not Mac where everything is NS. Um, we do know that if it's a UI something, it's probably a view, maybe. Like, uh, if I could say, you know, I've got this uh, UI bar button item, right? There's no word view in there, but we can generally assume it's, it's a view concept. And we automatically assume that anything with controller in the name must be a controller, right? And so we, we use this as we're going through our, our code and we're like, well, this isn't really a view. This isn't really a model. So it must be a controller, right? <laughs> Everything's a controller. And then we run out of... Uh, words to put in front of controller, and then we call them managers instead. But you know, it's the same thing. Um, but then sometimes we come across these weird concepts where they just kind of like don't make sense, like view model, right? Those are on opposite sides, but yet somehow right next to each other. Or we get something like a model controller, which I guess would be like the bridge between the two. It's just naming affects how we look at something. And if we choose the wrong name, we can kind of like paint ourselves into a, into a corner of understanding. Um, some of the things we're going to be talking about are, are poorly named. Um, and there's nothing we can really do about that. But just remember that naming affects how we look at things. So observation three, then. UI view controller, despite the name, is not a controller. Before you all come at me with pitchforks about this, let's take a look at what a UI, UI view controller actually does. Um, it loads views. It shows views. It lays out views. It rotates views. 
Uh, it transitions between views, and it does pretty much anything you want with views. Huh. Well, maybe then if a UI view controller only does view related things, it's really a view and not a controller. So, like, what are the implications of this? What does this mean? Well, it means that we shouldn't be doing anything with the network in a view. We should not be persisting data, a model level concept, in the view. We should not be performing navigation, which is a flow or a controller related concept, in a view. We should not be implementing our business algorithms in a view. We should not be observing the model directly for changes in a view. So what should we be doing? We should, from a controller, be receiving an intention. And I'm going to be using this word a lot, intention. This is like the general, here's what you're supposed to do. So we receive an intention. We're going to translate that intention or extract from that intention the, the specific data that we need to put into our UI views. We're going to implement some IB actions. We're going to translate that IB action back into an intention that corresponds with the intention that we received. And then we will somehow propagate that intention to a controller. And a good way to think about what we should be putting in a UI view controller, given that it's a view level concept, is by asking ourselves this question. Would I put this logic in a subclass of UI label? UI label is also a view level concept, so is a UI button. And if you wouldn't put persisting data to disk inside a UI button subclass, then maybe we should think about not putting it in a UI view controller subclass, because they're both MVC views. And I hope you all have the gut reaction of kind of like, yeah, persisting data in a button, yeah. That is the proper reaction. So our fourth observation, views are small. So small views. Views are the unit of creating our UI. Uh, we make UI by composing views. And one of the big things that, uh, that comes up is that a view does not fill a screen, right? Uh, uh, the screen has a view. In fact, the screen has many views. So what does this mean? It means we have small UI view controllers. This is a really important concept, I think. A UI view controller does not equal a screen of concept, or a screen of content. And I want to make sure you understand this. You do not have to fill the screen with a single UI view controller. To make sure you get this, you can show many view controllers on the same screen. Just to drive it home, a single screen can show lots of view controllers. Okay? One of the big problems I have with, uh, with sample code um, is the assumption that if I'm looking at a screen, it's a single view controller. We kind of get a little hand wavy when we're talking about iPad, when we've got like, oh, it's a split view, and then there's a single view controller on the left that's the master, and a single view controller on the right that's the detail. Does not have to be that way. Okay, I hope this is blowing your mind that you can put multiple view controllers on the same screen. Okay, observation number five. Views are composable. So composing is the idea that in order to make something big, we add together a lot of little things. And of course, the inverse is decomposition. This is not rotting. It's the idea of breaking stuff down into little pieces. Um, and I would argue that composition, the ability to compose and the ability to decompose, is the fundamental skill of a programmer. In my experience, all of the really, really great programmers, whether they are juniors or seniors or anyone, the, th the single thing that defines their excellence is whether or not they recognize 
how to break apart problems into smaller ones, and how to build together answers into a larger one. So how do we compose views? Well, with UI view, it's just add sub view, right? With UI view controller, we use a concept called child view controllers. Um, this is, I hope you're familiar with this, but if, if not, well, they were added in iOS 5. You kind of have no excuse for not knowing what they are. Um, child view controllers are to UI view controller uh, what sub views are to UI view. Um, UI view controller is actually, a, or, or uh, view controller containment is actually a, a concept that guides a, a few key APIs. Um, this is, for example, how all navigation works uh, on iOS. When you push view controller on a UI navigation controller, it's just really adding that new view controller as a child and then animating between two UI views. Uh, UI search controller is also a container view controller. It, it composes another view controller that uh, displays the list of results. Um, I also added UI refresh control up here. Uh, there's an interesting story behind this. Um, I wish to apologize right now. I wrote the original implementation of UI refresh control. Um, it was buggy, and I'm sorry. Um, but the stretchy blob was really cool. Um, took me weeks to get that right. Um, with UI refresh control, uh, we deliberately made the decision to only expose the refresh control API on UI table view controller as a way to encourage developers to use view controller containment. Our thinking was that if developers could only use a refresh control with UI table view controller, then if they wanted to use it, they would have to use UI table view controller and then compose UI table view controller inside another UI view controller. Um, despite our intentions, it really didn't kind of work out that way uh, for other reasons, but that was, that was the reasoning behind it. So we can, we can uh, add view controllers together in composition. Okay, observation number six. Views are reusable. Uh, and I'm not necessarily talking about the concept of reuse that we see from, from UI table view. Uh, I'm talking about the idea that we can allocate multiple instances of them. For example, every time I need to show some text on the screen, I do not create a new subclass of UI label. Um, I just allocate a new instance of an existing class. Um, so why do we think that every time we need to show stuff on the screen, we have to subclass UI view controller again? I would say that we don't. I would say as you, as you write your UI view controller classes, subclasses, write them with the intention that you will end up allocating multiple instances of them. Um, how often do we come across, you know, like a main screen view controller where there is and only ever will be one of them? Or like, you know, this is, you know, the very specific use case view controller. And, and granted, like, those might exist in a couple of places uh, as you apply these observations to MVC. Um, but I would hope that as you work up uh, to the point of reusing view controllers, that you, you follow kind of this thinking. The idea that if you're building a Twitter app, you're not building a tweet list view controller. What you're actually building is a list view controller that just happens to be showing tweets. Or the idea that, uh, you know, I've got this, this uh, uh, the, I want to like asynchronously load an image from a network. I'm not building a UI image view that does networking under the hood. I'm perhaps even making an image view controller that owns a UI image view. And then maybe it's the image view controller that's talking to an image provider, and maybe the image provider is asynchronously hitting the network or you know, reading it from a cache or whatever. Or that you know, if I've got a screen where I want to show a, an activity indicator to, show, to indicate uh, loading, it's not a custom view that I'm swapping out and, or hiding and just like placing an activity indicator in the middle of it. Um, I've actually created a container UI view controller and I'm swapping in a loading view controller, and then once I have the content ready behind the screens, I'm swapping it out for whatever that content view controller is. Maybe it's another list view controller that's showing you know, cars or whatever. This is the idea behind reusing view controllers. You create these view controllers that are useful in multiple situations. So like, 
if you're writing an app that does this sort of loading and then maybe it has you know, like the final content state or an error state, like you've actually got four view controllers, right? You've got the view controller that holds them all and it's really just a, a container view controller. You give it a child and say, show this child. Um, you've got a loading view controller and that's what you show when you're hitting the network behind the, screen, the scenes. You have an error, a, a message view controller, and this is the view controller you say, you know, here, show this message, and it's just kind of like the static error message in the middle. And then you have the, the final actual content view controller. Maybe it's like your list or whatever. Um, and then you're just moving between them. And you're not like fiddling around with view hierarchies and, uh, you know, hiding things and, and whatnot. Okay, observation number seven. In general, views show data or children. So let's talk about how we make views. Um, when we talk about views on the screen, they generally do one of two things. Uh, they add logic and layout through, comp through composition. And this is like, a, you know, instead of showing anything directly, they're just going to kind of delegate or like pass that intention on to other hidden children and then just position them to look nice. Um, or they actually draw things. They actually paint on the screen. Um, this is how every single view provided by UIKit works. A UI button looks like a single thing. In reality, under the hood, there's like, uh, well, there used to be an image view that would draw like the border around the button, but then iOS 7 happened. Um, so there used to be like the image view for the border, and then there's a label in the middle to show your text. There might have been an image view if you've got a, an image on your button, and then there's the touch handling which happens at the UI button level. But the button itself only does the logic and it show, passes the painting responsibilities on to its subviews. Uh, same thing with the UI progress view, the, the bar. Um, the outer UI progress view is just positioning some subviews. And the subviews are some image views to like, here's the left cap, here's the bar that fills the middle, and here's the right cap, and it's just moving them around and stretching them out to be the right width. Even something like a UI text field, uh, it's really kind of like a, a button in the sense of like you've got the, uh, the text field, you've got an image view for drawing the border, you've got a UI label for rendering the text in the text field, and then it's got some touch handling such that when you tap on it, it brings up the editor UI. The stuff that you're typing in and you see text appear, that's really just the UI label. Um, it's really fascinating to pause your apps at runtime and use the view debugger and see how these things are built. And you find that all UI views end up really just using these primitives of label and image view, uh, and with rare exception, something else, to do all of their painting. So let's apply this to UI view controller. Maybe in general, UI view controllers should either put d data directly into UI views that it owns, or compose other UI view controllers. Now, I, I mentioned this with, with kind of like that loading screen example. There are some exceptions to this. Um, and this is where, you know, you have a, uh, a containment situation where you actually need to visually indicate some aspects of the containment. So for like a tab view controller, um, it actually owns the, the UI view that displays the tabs. It doesn't have to, it could use a private child view controller that's like a tab bar controller, like an actual bar controller. Um, Ditto UI navigation controller currently just owns uh, its UI navigation bar and, and manages both putting things in the bar and also managing the child moving around underneath. Same thing with search controller running the search field and stuff. But again, like in general, views either compose or they paint. So observation number eight, you still need actual controllers. Um, all of the observations that we've been making so far about MVC have really just been about the view, right? We're not really talking about how uh, things happen in the controller layer. Like for that, you're gonna wanna probably read about coordinators. Um, you're gonna wanna talk to Christoph about uh, routing and stuff. Um, we're t definitely not talking about how to persist data. So just recognize that like, this concept is really all just view. So where is that logic? Well, this, this approach really dumbs down a UI view controller. 
Uh, if you follow this approach, you will find that your view controllers end up being about 200 lines of code. Um, I have written view controllers that are like 10 and are still really useful. Um, another another uh, result of this is that UI view controllers never context. Uh, just like your UI labels don't know that, it, that they're being shown on a settings screen versus inside a tab bar versus inside a button, uh, your UI view controllers don't know that either. Um, so your UI view controllers, they still have to somehow pass this intention out. Uh, maybe it can be through delegation. Uh, maybe it could be like it receives some protocol typed uh, controller object through dependency injection and so on. So let's take uh, a look at a case study really quick. Uh, this is an app I'm pretty familiar with. It's the WWDC app. Uh, for three years, I was the lead engineer on it. Um, it looks like this. Uh, this is not an extra tall iPhone. This is multiple screenshots stitched together so we can see everything. Um, this, this screen, the session detail screen, has a, a few different purposes. We can watch a video. Uh, we read information about a session. Uh, we perform actions. We browse related sessions and a couple others. So let's take a look at what this actually means. So we've got some logic. We need to observe some model changes because like, we might uh, happen to load a, an updated copy of the model under the hood. Um, we've got, um, we need a, a way to determine which contextual actions to show. Uh, we need to observe the, the action state, so whether we should show a download button versus an in-progress download versus you know, delete this uh, thing. Uh, we need a way to list related videos, and then we have our corresponding actions. Uh, we have the ability to favorite a session, we can share a session, uh, we can watch a movie uh, by tapping on the, the main poster frame. Um, we've got our contextual actions, and March, March, March is watched, download, and leave feedback. And of course, we can watch related uh, movies. Now, if we were to do all of this in a single view controller, we'd have a massive view controller, right? Nobody wants this. This would be terrible. This would be a nightmare to maintain. So again, using that principle that if we wouldn't make that entire screen a single subclass of UI view, then let's not make it a single UI controller, OK? So what would that look like? Well, we will need a view controller that owns the stuff that's going on inside it. Uh, let's make a view controller for owning the poster frame for the movie. Uh, let's make a view controller for owning just the title. Um, I'm not really going to show why, but it just has to do with rotation and placement of stuff when things rotate. Um, let's also have a different view controller for session details, uh, the, the summary and time and stuff. Let's have a view controller that manages the list of actions. And let's have a view controller for showing related sessions. Right? We're going to compose the UI from smaller things. So we've got a session detail view controller a session video poster view controller. We've got our title view controller. We've got our description view controller. We've got our actions view controller. We've got lots of view controllers. We've got related content view controller and all of these things. So how does the communication work with these? Well, we still have some controller object out there, and I'm just kind of like going to leave this as a blue box to indicate that we're not talking about that. But this controller is going to give the session object to the session detail view controller. And it's just going to say, display this session. This is the intention. We want to show, see information about a session. Now, the session detail view controller is going to turn around, it's going to construct these children, and it's going to pass down the little pieces of information that they need. Okay. So hopefully you're starting to recognize bits from other architectural patterns. Now, these uh, child view controllers, they, they do things, right? Um, so how does that happen? Well, like I said, there's one, one way we can do it. We can maybe like assign a block for them to, to call or give them a delegate, which is kind of the same thing. Um, but you know, something's going to happen is like, hey, we tapped a poster, and that's going to you know, delegate it back out. Or you know, hey, we tapped a related video. And that's really all that's going to happen at that point, because that's the level of intention that those children know about. But the session detail view controller knows about a higher level concept of sessions. And so it's going to then translate this information of like, I tap this, this button or whatever into like an actual higher level concept of now we need to watch a video, 
versus, hey, the user tapped this button. So that's, that's one approach. Uh, another approach is that um, instead of doing this with de uh, delegates, we actually give a controller object directly to, this, to the children. Um, these should be protocol types so that you can easily swap them out or uh, mock them with a, a different uh, conforming object for unit tests and so on. Uh, so we have, would have like a movie watcher object um, and we would also have, um, you know, and it, these are going to get the messages like, hey, we tapped on this, this related video. And then since this is a controller, uh, maybe it's the main controller for the flow. Maybe it's some subcontroller. Uh, kind of doesn't matter because it's just a protocol. But this will then propagate that around through the controller layer until you decide that the intention, the resulting intention is like, we need to present a movie screen or slide on something else or whatever. Um, similarly, if we're going to, you know, uh, allow for some actions, then you know the actions view controller would receive that action and then react co correspondingly. So this is how we all end up with uh, the idea of a better MVC. We make these observations about uh, the state of things, and when we end up with this, um, we actually get some pretty cool results. I see taking pictures, so I'll pause for a second. We good? Okay. So what do we end up with? We end up with tiny UI view controllers. Uh, like I said, most UI view controllers are under 200 lines. It's rare to have anything longer than 500, like exceptionally rare. Uh, a 500 line view controller would be something like uh, a list view controller that's allowing for every possible kind of action that a UI table view supports, like reordering and swipe actions and stuff. But like 200 is common. Uh, 100 is also common. Less than 100 I've seen as well. Um, because really these, they just get an object and it's like, oh, you know, pull out this text, put it in that label, you know, get this, put it in that label. It's, it's really simple. Um, you will find that you rarely subclass UI view anymore. Uh, this is actually kind of interesting, because the idea is that a UI view directly becomes this thing that only paints. It only draws things. And so uh, unless you find yourself needing to actually override draw rect or meaningfully affect how drawing is done, uh, you don't really subclass UI view anymore. Uh, you do it all in a, in a UI view controller for that situation. Uh, you end up with these extremely reusable view con UI view controllers. Uh, like a list view controller, or a loading screen view controller, or a message view controller, or just like a, a container view controller that has a content property and you assign a new view controller as the content view controller and it just like animates between the two of them and stuff. It's, it's, you know, highly reusable view controllers. But one of the big things is that like you have this clear separation of concern. Like, I don't have to wonder like, oh, you know, networking and like, is that going to go and like the, the profile view controller when it needs to save the profile image or like do I pull that out into like a, a networking profile manager thing like that answer is done like saving an image to to a, a, a service or to disk like this is not a view concept okay don't put it in a view one of the biggest and best results I find for you happy programmers because uh, we don't have to deal with these 10,000 line monstrosities anymore. Ain't nobody got time for that. And so we get to focus on dealing with the things that actually make our app fun. So uh, we're, we're out of time. Thank you for listening. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, there's various ways. Um, but one thing I do want to point out, this was announced just like an hour or two ago. Uh, we've got official dates for WWDC now, so thank you very much.